To my state and local online students, this is Professor Wagner, and this is the first of several important videos and podcasts I'll be making for our discussion boards. To understand any government, a good place to start is the Constitution. Well, Florida's Constitution was ratified in 1968. We've had a total of five constitutions in this state, and we are on our fifth one now. It has a total of 12 articles, and I'm not going to talk about every article. I'm just going to highlight certain unique aspects of our state constitution. But one more detail you need to know before I get started on that is that whenever we amend our state constitution, which is frequent, we file the amendment under the appropriate article, so we don't just file them all at the end as we would say with the federal constitution. So let's start with the preamble. We, the people of the state of Florida, being grateful to Almighty God for our constitutional liberty, in order to secure its benefits, perfect our government, ensure domestic tranquility, maintain public order, and guarantee equal civil and political rights to all, do ordain and establish this constitution. To understand our state constitution and this preamble in context, let me tell you what was happening at the federal level, mainly from the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, we are all subject to the U.S. Constitution, and in practice, that Constitution is interpreted by the Supreme Court. And from about the 1940s until about the 1970s, the U.S. Supreme Court had a pattern of giving rulings that seemingly favored individual liberties, seemingly favored civil rights, and largely eroded the autonomy of the states. Um, this included everything from striking down organized prayer in public schools to eventually requiring all states to allow abortions in the Roe v. Wade case. Now, from about the 80s until the present, the courts have been gradually scaling back some of those rulings and slowly returning rights back to the states. But that's not really reflected in our state constitution because it was ratified in 1968. So much of the first article is consistent with those U.S. Supreme Court rulings. Nonetheless, we wanted to make it clear that we are a God-fearing state. That is why in the preamble you'll see the mention of Almighty God. And as I'm about to explain as I go into Article 1, we did comply with these U.S. Supreme Court rulings, but we did so begrudgingly. I remember my grandpa telling me about the early days of Florida. So, Article 1, much of it reiterates the U.S. Bill of Rights, thereby complying with the incorporation as set up by the U.S. Supreme Court. In particular, this affects the relationship between church and state. It is specified in our state constitution that there is to be a separation of church and state, and it is specified that free expression of religion is protected. The one big limit on that is that it also specifies in our state constitution that free expression of religion does not mean that behavior that violates public moral standards is protected. Therefore, the states still retain the right to some extent to regulate morality, as long as they're not targeting a particular religion. And I will add that the U.S. Supreme Court, for the most part, has upheld that. Now, a few other things that stand out about our state constitution, we are a right-to-work state. What that means is that when it comes to labor unions, your right to unionize is protected. That's in our state constitution. All workers have the right to form a labor union and join a labor union. However, you can never be made to join a union as a condition of employment. In some states, such as Wisconsin, such as Michigan, employers and unions will make a contract whereby they agree that anyone who comes to work for the company must join the union, say, within 30 days, or they can't work for the company. That would be illegal in the state of Florida, as it would be in any right-to-work state. Furthermore, Article 1 very specifically protects privacy rights. Privacy rights are not so clearly spelled out in the U.S. Constitution. They're understood, but they're not enumerated so clearly. But they are in our state constitution. Now, before I move on to the next part, the last thing I want to talk about regarding church and state is that um, the U.S. Supreme Court has somewhat backtracked on its earlier ruling. There doesn't really have to be a strict separation of church and state according to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
Mainly, states just are not allowed to discriminate against one religion or another. What that means, for example, is that school vouchers, where the money may go to religious schools, that is allowed according to the U.S. Supreme Court. However, it is not allowed according to the Florida Supreme Court. And that's because we have that part that specifies separation of church and state, and the Florida Supreme Court interpreted that to mean, and I think correctly so, just based on the way it's currently written, that there can be no public funds that go to a religious organization. If we want to change that, we can amend our state constitution, and we attempted to do so, but it didn't get the votes, it didn't pass. So based on our state constitution, currently there can be no state funds that go to religious organizations. Now, speaking of amendments, let me skip to a very interesting amendment we added in the last election cycle. So Article 3 deals with our legislative branch, and I'm not going to go into too much there. I'll let the textbook handle that. However, we very recently added an anti-gerrymandering amendment to our Constitution. For those of you who don't know, gerrymandering is when the legislature draws districts in a way to favor a political party or candidate. That is no longer allowed in the state of Florida. Now, this is just recent. It's going to take some time for this to really take effect. But what that means is they're no longer allowed to draw these very obviously, say, Republican districts and others that are very obviously Democratic, where the candidate simply can't lose because the voters are overwhelmingly of one party or another. They now must draw the districts in a way that respects more traditional boundaries, like, let's say, a river. They can't zigzag back and forth across the river to try to carve a special district for a certain income that they want to keep winning. I think this is going to make future elections in Florida far more competitive, and I'm very excited to see how this all plays out. Now, on to our executive branch. We have a cabinet-style executive. Very unusual to find this anywhere in the world. What this means is that when it comes to executive decisions, we elect our governor, and then we elect currently three members of the cabinet. We elect the attorney general, we elect the commissioner of agriculture, and we elect the chief financial officer. So altogether, there are four elected members of the executive branch, and when it comes to decisions, those four individuals have to make those decisions as a group. So our current governor is Governor Rick Scott, and then we have Pam Bondi, the Attorney General. We have Jeff Atwater, the Chief Financial Officer, and Adam Putnam, the Commissioner of Agriculture. If there is a tie when they're making a decision, the governor's decision prevails. So the only way to overturn the governor within the executive branch is for those three people to band together. We've always been wary of a very powerful executive in this state. It goes back to the Civil War, and that's still reflected in our Constitution to this day. So moving on to our judicial branch, remember that judicial branches are not meant to be democratic, lowercase d. That is, they're not meant to reflect the will of the people. They're meant to interpret the Constitution. There are some states, such as Texas, where they elect their judges in very partisan elections, and it could be argued that that essentially erodes their Constitution because judges are more interested then in getting elected than they are in doing their jobs. On the other end of the spectrum, you have our U.S. Supreme Court. They're appointed for life. So once they're appointed, once they're in there, there's very little, if any, accountability. We have found a healthy medium here in Florida. First off, our Florida Supreme Court is made up of no more than seven judges. They are appointed by the governor because we don't want this to be a popularity contest. Uh, they're recommended by a very objective judicial nominating committee, and then the governor out of that short list picks the ones he wants. This is to ensure that these judges are highly qualified and hopefully nonpartisan. We do have some say as the people. We don't appoint our judges for life so they can't go mad with power, some would argue our U.S. Supreme Court has. Every election cycle, the people can vote whether or not to retain the judge. So they're not exactly getting reelected, but if we were to vote to remove the judge, then that judge would be removed and the governor would appoint a new judge. 
this actually doesn't happen very often. So the judges know that for the most part, they can focus on doing their job. But if they were to just get out of hand and start giving a bunch of arbitrary rulings, we the people would likely punish them for doing so. So how do we pay for those super highways? Well, that's paid for with tax money. But in the state of Florida, long story short, we hate taxes. So our constitution is designed to protect us from being overtaxed. So let me go through the major items there. First, you've probably heard we have no state income tax, and this is true. Believe it or not, it's actually allowed, however, in our state constitution. There may be a state income tax of up to 5%, but no more. However, we do not use that for individuals. There is, however, a corporate income tax of 5%. And as I understand, the first $25,000 a year of corporate income is exempt. That's to protect smaller businesses. Sales taxes are used in the state of Florida, but the state sales tax may never exceed 6%. Counties are allowed to add an additional 1.5%. So depending on the county you live in, it could be as high as 7.5%. That's really not terribly high. I'm back and forth between Florida and the state of Tennessee right now, and Tennessee has a sales tax of 9.25%. Um, in some states, it exceeds 10%. Now, on to property taxes... The state may not collect any more than two mills per year, and counties may collect no more than ten mills per year. Let me tell you what a mill is. A mill is one dollar for every one thousand dollars of property value. So, if there is a state property tax of two mills, that means that to the state of Florida, if your house is worth one hundred thousand dollars, you would pay two hundred dollars. If there are 10 mills to the county, you would pay another $1,000 to the county. So that would be $1,200 for $100,000 of property value. However, you're probably not paying that much because if you live there, you get homestead exemption. That means that you can exempt the first $25,000 of property value from taxes. Furthermore, if you've lived in that house for many, many years, and it is your homestead, you file for homestead exemption every year, according to our Constitution, when they appraise the property value, they may not raise it by any more than 3% every year for tax purposes. So your tax purpose property value is probably much lower than the actual property value. This is to protect native Floridians from rising housing costs. Uh, that largely is because of all the snowbirds that move down here and drive up property values. Furthermore, it is specified in this article that the state may not pledge credit to the private sector. So all those corporate bailouts you may remember from the end of the Bush era, early Obama era, all those loans to banks and insurance companies from the federal government, well, that cannot happen at the state level here in Florida. The state of Florida is also required to balance the budget every year. Our federal government has a soaring national debt of $17 trillion, and it's growing, and there doesn't seem to be any plan to stop adding to that anytime soon. Well, that's not possible in the state of Florida because they must balance the budget every year. If the legislature fails to do so, the governor may make any necessary cuts in order to balance our state budget. So we have plenty of protections there to ensure that we don't get into the cycle of perpetual debt that we see our federal government in. All right, bear with me. We're almost done. I just need to talk about the amendment process, and then I'll wrap this all up. If we want to amend our state constitution, this is spelled out in Article 11. Every amendment must first be proposed, and then it must be ratified. There are three ways to propose it, and only one way to ratify it. An amendment can be proposed by three-fifths of the House and the Senate proposing it. It can also be proposed by a constitutional commission that meets every 20 years. The third way, and this is the most common, is by a petition of 8% of the electorate. So sometimes you'll see people asking you to sign a petition. If you sign it, what you're agreeing to is to put this on the ballot to be ratified. They need 8% or more of the electorate, and at least one signature must come from at least half of the counties in the state of Florida. So they have to spread out a little bit. They can't concentrate all in one area. Now, once it's on the ballot, and this is usually just put on every election cycle, 
it can be ratified by at least 60% of those who vote voting yes to ratify it. If it gets the 60 it needs, then it becomes part of our state constitution. Now, these amendments, each one can only deal with one particular item, so they can't put a bunch of stuff under one amendment. If they do so, then the Florida Supreme Court would strike it down. So let's wrap this all up. Dr. Corgan, a former professor of mine at UNF, used to say that Florida is the red-headed stepchild of the South. That is certainly reflected in our state constitution. Uh, no offense to redheads, by the way. Gingers do have souls. So our constitution certainly reflects our internal conflicts. Being a state that values individual liberties, entrepreneurs, but is also on the edge of the Bible Belt. Currently, there are significant protections for individual liberties in our constitution. However, we do not currently allow school vouchers, so... We are still, for the most part, subject to the public school system, unless you can afford to send your kid to a private school. Furthermore, we recently banned same-sex marriage. It was never allowed in Florida anyway, but it's now in our Constitution that there can be no same-sex marriage in Florida, nor can there be civil unions. Now, this can always be changed. Both of those pieces and many others can be changed, of course, by a new amendment. Uh, we are a low-tax state. We're a fiscally conservative state as well. So that means that when we cut taxes, we would also have to cut spending accordingly. That means that many will argue that our government is underfunded. But maybe the people of Florida like it that way. That's up to voters to decide at the ballot, isn't it? The people can always directly impact state law via the petition, so we can add new amendments to our state constitution. This got California in a lot of trouble recently because people were demanding so much from their government by petition, but how on earth was the government supposed to pay for it? Governor Schwarzenegger struggled to deal with this, and I don't think he was really able to balance California's budget. That's not an option in Florida, because our legislature does have to balance the budget every year. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my buffer music. Most of it comes from a local band called Mufro. Interesting name. Uh, the song is called Florida, and I'm going to turn it back over to them. Enjoy. I know some of fools who think I should let go But they never seen Florida through my eyes